Um, let's talk about Cinda Morgans tonight. This is my usual full disclosure statement. Um, and so I am uh, able to come to you with, um, with an independent perspective. So thank you for being here with me tonight. I appreciate you being here. appreciate your time and attention. Uh, we'll talk about Cinda Morgans. Um, this is a Facebook Live presentation. It's being recorded, uh, so it will be available later, and um, it'll be available on Facebook and YouTube. Please like, share, comment, subscribe. I really appreciate that. Uh, before I get started, um, I got an email from Ancestry a few hours ago. I was checking my email, and um, as I was looking for something else, this popped up, and it said, uh, we have a shared ancestor hint for your daughter, and it was on um, my my side, and so the wheels were turning. I'm not sure why it didn't uh, come up for me, uh, but unfortunately, it was a, a private tree. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, 24 Santa Morgans, the shared ancestor, or the shared matches list, didn't really provide any clarification, uh, but apparently uh, there's a shared ancestor in this Charles Henson, one of my ancestors, um, I'm not sure there's a really good lesson there, just uh, uh, felt that that was pretty surprising to um, have that um, public tree disappear in an instant. But um, these are the things that we encounter. So our goal tonight is to learn to use Cinemorgan values for family history research, and we'll um, approach this with uh, real examples that I've encountered in my research, and I, I think these will be helpful examples. So um, for me and for many of us, I think the progression in uh, becoming familiar with Santa Morgan starts with the general interest in the ethnicity reports, which leads to discovery of the match lists of uh, mysterious cousins, and then we start to look at the DNA details, the most prominent of which are the Santa Morgan values that are reported for our uh, matches. And um, we want to put this in perspective. Um, shared centimorgans, total shared centimorgans are very helpful and very important. Uh, they're referred to as genetic distance, and uh, we use that genetic distance in combination with genetic coordinates when we can get access to that. The matching segment details can give us a lot of additional information, so ideally we're using this, this, this information together. We're using uh, total centimorgans in combination with matching segment details to, to learn as much as possible about our matches and to explore our uh, family history to the fullest extent. But today uh, we're focused on centimorgans. We just don't want to lose sight of the other side of the picture. So uh, centimorgans are a unit of genetic distance, and this is the distance between chromosome positions, di distance between positions on chromosomes. One centimorgan is equal approximately to one million base pairs on average. Uh, base pairs, of course, are the individual letters of the genetic code. So one centimorgan is equal to about one million of those letters. Uh, greater distance means more DNA. So more centimorgans implies a stronger biological relationship, generally speaking. And we'll get into some details. Um, if you want to read about uh, centimorgans on your own and explore this topic in more depth, I, I certainly recommend the material that's on the International Society of Genetic Genealogy wiki pages. In particular, I recommend uh, the page entitled Centimorgan and the page entitled Autosomal DNA Statistics. Um, if you dive into that information, you'll know quite a bit, and uh, there's a lot of good information there. And th th These pages are linked here. Um, on this slide, you can find these links in the PDF file that I uploaded uh, tonight for this presentation. Um, these are some numbers that I've found to be helpful. They're, I think they're easy to remember. They're, these numbers are not at the exact midpoint uh, for each of the ranges that you see for each of these relationships. Uh, so bear in mind that these are not averages or uh, the, the middle of the range but they are easy to remember and they've served me well and, and I think they are uh, fairly representative of what we see with these relationships. So with parent-child relationships, you see about uh, 3,500 centimorgans. Uh, with full siblings, 2,500, grandparents, 1,700, first cousins, the thousands, and, and, and so on. Um, and again, um, you need to be familiar with the ranges 
uh, and you'll uh, get that from various tables and tools that are available. But I think if you keep these numbers in mind, it's easy to um, it's e easy to um, keep these simple uh, round numbers um, in mind to to um, sort things out quickly. And one other thing that I'll mention, you'll see here, I've put. Uh, first cousin once removed next to first cousin, and you'll see that the number for first cousin once removed is half of what you see with first the first cousin relationship. So uh, that's another way to make this information easier to remember. If you have a first cousin who shares about a thousand centimorgans with you, you'll expect a first cousin once removed that uh, that first cousin's child uh, should share about half. And uh, so uh, you don't necessarily have to pull up a table or a tool uh, to think about these relationships that way. Um, these, these are very simple ways of uh, remembering these numbers. Um, and, and it works the other way around. If you have a, a first cousin once removed who shares about 500 centimorgans with you, that, that's a normal number for that relationship. And you can double uh, that number to uh, know what to expect with, with the first cousin. So just some general rules of thumb there. Um, finding the Centimorgan values at the various DNA testing, DNA matching companies um, is variable because the uh, websites are so different. Um, at Ancestry DNA, the information for shared Centimorgans, total shared Centimorgans is tucked away um, and uh, it's a little harder to find, so we'll talk about that briefly. Um, the first step to find that, finding that information is to click on the link for your DNA match, and then when you get to the DNA match page, you find the tiny lowercase i near the top of the page, and click on that, and you'll find um, you'll find what you're looking for. So we'll start off. Our first example tonight is Jack. He is a new match. Um, he's a very accomplished and not knowledgeable uh, gentleman, so it's it's nice to have him as a as a match, and we've been working together recently. Um, I found him on my match list, so if you click on uh, the, the link to find your match list, uh, you'll find matches of interest. In this case, we're looking for Jack. Um, he's predicted to be in the second to third cousin range for me. So I, I, if I click on, uh, click on Jack, I'm taken to our match page, and you'll see there this uh, little gray disc with the lowercase i. If you click on that, you'll find the amount of uh, DNA that you share with your match um, and get uh, more specific information. So uh, 271 centimorgans in this case. Um, and again, I've um, been working with Jack over the past couple of weeks and uh, he had no trouble at all getting onto GEDmatch so that we could find some more detailed information. And these are the matching segment details. Uh, we also see that the total centimorgans that are shared in this case are almost exactly the same as what Ancestry is reporting, so it's nice to have that um, line up um, equally. Um, and and I, I show this so that, again, we don't lose sight of the fact that total centimorgans, as, as useful as they are, um, it's, it's, it's important to get access to the full spectrum of matching seg segment details if you can get that. And in this case, I was able to uh, encourage Jack to go to GEDmatch so that we could get the matching segment details and armed with these matching segment details we could go a lot further and find out exactly how we're related or confirm exactly how we're related. So uh, we're going to be focused on total centimorgans uh, tonight, uh, but we don't, we, we don't want to forget the value of the matching segment details. And this is just a graphical representation of those uh, matching segment details. So again, we share uh, 200, approximately 270 centimorgans. Uh, that DNA is distributed across the genome in, in very specific locations, and the specific location uh, of each segment tells us something about our shared history. And so um, we want to remember that um, this is useful information uh, that, that we can uh, get access to if we transfer or if we upload uh, files to GEDmatch and other websites. So again, we're going to look at total centimorgans tonight. And, and so the question in this case is, what does it mean that we share 271 centimorgans? Um, and you can approach this uh, different ways. There are uh, many tables scattered across the internet and, and Pinterest groups and uh, blogs and uh, other, other um, resources. 
Um, in this case, uh, 271 centimorgans takes us to group D and group E on the green DNA detectives chart that you often see uh, shared in the Facebook groups. So uh, 271 centimorgans um, makes us fall into um, one of these two groups. Um, the, so one of the possibilities for group D is first cousin once removed, and one of the possibilities for group E is second cousin. So um, these are the possibilities that uh, 271 uh, centimorgans brings us to, um, according to uh, the green chart that we often see. We can also use a tool such as the popular uh, shared centimorgan tool at DNA Painter. Uh, this is uh, from Johnny Pearl. Um, this, this is a very popular resource for good reason. Um, if we plug 271 centimorgans into this tool, uh, we're told that group E is the uh, most probable scenario by far, a 60% chance of uh, a match uh, coming from this category with 271 centimorgans. So that includes the possibility of second cousins. Group F and group D are also possible uh, with this amount of DNA. Um, about 20% chance of group F, 20% chance of group D, and the possibilities there include a half second cousin or half first cousin, but those are thought to be uh, less likely according to the information provided by DNA Painter. So what did we actually find in this case? Uh, it wasn't hard to find our shared ancestry uh, because Jack uh, knows his history, and although he doesn't have a tree on um, ancestry, um, he, he knows who his ancestors are, and um, uh, my father was his second cousin. So this one was easy to sort out, um, but as you can see, the prediction or the actual relationship here um, is, a, is, a look, is not quite uh, what um, the, the green chart and uh, Johnny Pearl's tool uh, were predicting. Um, so an important lesson here is that DNA is passed across generations randomly and relationship predictions based on centimorgans cannot pinpoint the distance of the relationship with absolute perfect accuracy. Uh, real results deviate from expected averages. You can get uh, low probability results. You can get scenarios that are essentially off the charts, so to speak. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. In some cases, when uh, the results deviate extremely, we have to uh, re-examine our assumptions uh, but in some cases, we just have to accept the fact that we're going to see some um, lower probability scenarios when we look at scores, dozens, uh, hundreds of, of cousins. Um, we're we're going to see some low probability scenarios from time to time. So this can uh, lead us to another lesson. Um, and I compare Jack to multiple family members. So there. Uh, you can see 286.5 for me. There's a whole range of possibilities here. I've compared Jack to all of my uh, tested siblings, and these are all full siblings, and yet uh, we've, we have a real a big range of possibilities. The lowest number here is less than half of the biggest number, so quite a big range here. Uh, but if we, if we take the average of these numbers, we get 175.4, and then if we uh, take that number and go back to our green chart, um, we see that um, uh, group F comes into play, and there we have the second cousin once removed uh, category of uh, possibilities. So um, by looking at the average for my entire family, uh, we got closer to the truth, and, and so um, I think there's an important lesson there. So, so same thing with Johnny Pearl's tool. Uh, we put 175.4 into that tool, and then the category, including second cousin once removed, uh, rises to the top of the list as the most probable explanation for the shared DNA. So um, what we see with uh, an individual DNA test result uh, pales in comparison to what we see when we compare with multiple family members, and I would certainly encourage you uh, to test as many people as possible in your family. When I first got into genetic genealogy, I really didn't understand why there were so many people testing large number of uh, large numbers of family members, and, and now it's much more clear. So make as many uh, comparisons as you can. That's the, the lesson of this example. 
So now we can move on to examples, uh, example two, and this is a two-part example. Um, so uh, one of these examples, um, we have an 80, uh, 83 centimorgan match, and Ancestry is predicting that uh, this match is a fourth cousin relationship, and Ancestry is predicting this fourth cousin relationship with extremely high confidence. Uh, you can see in fine print that they're saying that there's a range. It could be anywhere in the fourth to sixth cousin range, but uh, they're apparently extremely confident that uh, this is a fourth cousin relationship. And then we contrast this to example 2B. Um, this is just a 7.7 .7 centimorgan relationship, so a much more distant relationship. Uh, this is predicted to be distant cousins. Uh, with moderate confidence, that's the lowest level of confidence that um, Ancestry DNA reports. Uh, so a, a stark contrast here, and uh, we can uh, take a look at uh, this from uh, the perspective of Johnny Pearl's calculator. If we put 83 centimorgans into the calculator uh, with uh, 2A, we get a third cousin prediction among other uh, closely related possibilities, and with example 2B, we get um, a range of uh, possibilities, including a sixth cousin, seventh cousin, seventh cousin, and others. Um, so all of those uh, possibilities with example 2B are uh, considerably more distant than the possibilities with example 2A. So then we move on and, and we look at what the actual relationship is in this case. This is actually the same person being compared against two full siblings. So uh, example 2A is uh, Cheryl, cousin Cheryl, compared to me, and example 2B is cousin Cheryl compared to my full sister, and yet we have this huge range. Um, sometimes uh, you get extreme results, and it's important to keep that in mind. So this, the actual relationship here is half first cousin, three times removed. It's the same relationship with both people. So again, relationship predictions based on Cinemorgans cannot pinpoint the distance of the relationship with absolute perfect accuracy. Real results deviate considerably from the average. Uh, so you, you really want to make uh, a lot of comparisons so you can get a fuller, more complete picture. If my sister had been the only person in the family to test, um, we would have never known that Cheryl was an interesting match because it's so distant. Um, that match is at the bottom of the pile and we never really would have paid attention to it. So now moving on to example three, um, the image here is partially obscured, uh, but this is Thomas Mann and Elizabeth Denton. Uh, this is a match for my sister. This match also matches me, but my sister is the best match in the family, so we're focused on he her in this example. And here we have uh, a distant, a very distant relationship, seventh cousins once removed. Um, that, that's, that's an interesting uh, distance. Um, you have to wonder um, if uh, you can reliably detect this relationship with DNA. But we have a shared ancestor hint, so that, that makes it more interesting. These shared ancestor hints are, are fairly seductive, and uh, they're hard to ignore if you're sorting through your match list. So let's take a look at this a little closer, and we see that this is a 94 Centimorgan relationship. 94 Centimorgans is a pretty good um, uh, match for most people. It's a pretty good match for me. In most cases, when we share 94 Centimorgans or about that much DNA, uh, we can find find a good explanation for the shared DNA. But 94 Centimorgans, if you're familiar with these numbers, is a very large number for seventh cousins once removed. So you should be suspicious when you see something like this. Um, it's 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 not uh, you don't expect to share any DNA with a cousin this distant. Um, in fact, I have a table from um, the ISAG wiki, um, and this uh, shows the probability of showing, uh, sharing no DNA at all with various relationships. So you can see there at the top with first cousins, they always share DNA. So the probability of sharing no DNA with a first cousin is essentially zero. As you move down, you get down to third cousins, some of, the, of your third cousins will share no DNA with you. Uh, you get all the way down to sixth cousin once removed. Um, you're probably not going to share any DNA at all with uh, people that distant. Uh, this chart is based on simulated data, and it's telling us that there's a 94% chance of sharing absolutely no DNA at all with a, a cousin that distant. Um, so to share DNA and to share 
a, a good bit of DNA with a cousin this distant should really uh, cause us to be suspicious. So um, plugging this number into Johnny Pearl's calculator, um, the issue here becomes more stark. Um, the, this calculator is telling us that um, the probability of having or seeing a seventh cousin once removed relationship with this much DNA, with 94 centimorgans of DNA, is only 0.42%. And I would say that percentage is probably generous. Um, even, the, even that low number is, is probably on the generous side. So uh, we should really be suspicious. And in this case, we actually did find a closer relationship uh, over about a year and a half period with help from uh, my cousin Brian Smith. Uh, we were able to find a much closer relationship, um, and we had to break down a brick wall to find this. So it wasn't easy. That's why it took so long. Um, it was my Smith line, and uh, John Smith, his parents weren't known. Uh, we eventually found his parents in Enigma, Georgia, of all places. Um, and, and so the lesson here is that by um, refusing to accept the shared ancestor hint at face value by um, being suspicious about the distance of that relationship and persisting in our research, we were able to make an interesting discovery. Um, and um, this may be one that's um, worthy of publication, so we'll look at that. But um, going back to this match, uh, based on the amount of shared DNA, um, Ancestor DNA was pr predicting that we were third cousins with extremely high confidence, uh, possibly third to fourth cousin range. Um, so there's a, a discrepancy between what the uh, DNA was saying and what the shared ancestor hint was saying. And um, of course, I think there are a lot of people who are aware of the fact that when you get a shared ancestor hint, you need to verify the paper trail. I think that's, that's very well known and very well understood. Uh, people uh, repeat, repeat that often and uh, they emphasize the fact that shared ancestor hints are, after all, only hints. Uh, but when you have these shared ancestor hints juxtaposed with shared DNA, um, it's very persuasive and I think sometimes people forget, not only do we need to um, verify the paper trail, but we need to scrutinize the DNA trail as well. We need to scrutinize that as carefully and we really need to be sure that we can uh, put the DNA evidence together with the paper trail evidence in a, in a harmonious marriage. Um, so just beware that with uh, shared ancestor hints, ancestor DNA makes no attempt to reconcile the Cinnamorgan values with the distance of the paper trail um, uh, relationship. Um, there's, there's really no attempt to um, make those, um, those um, make all of that fit together. And, and there's no warning that says, you know, hey, this is a seventh cousin once removed uh, relationship and yet you share too much DNA so you need to dig deeper. There's really a warning there. You have to think about it yourself. So again, the actual relationship turned out to be fourth cousins. I think this fourth cousin relationship accounts for most if not all of the 94 uh, centimorgans of shared DNA. Uh, the seventh cousin wants to remove relationship is probably not contributing any of the shared DNA and ultimately this led to a DNA circle connection. Uh, Reuben W. Smith was our new a newly discovered ancestor. Um, a lot of people already had this uh, gentleman in their tree, uh, but the documentation to connect my John Smith to this family uh, was very scarce and we, we probably never would have discovered it without the help of DNA evidence. And uh, it was interesting learning about this ancestor. He was definitely a beloved member of his community. And so uh, a very interesting discovery that came about as a result of uh, scrutinizing the DNA evidence as carefully as we scrutinized uh, the paper trail evidence. So that, that's an important lesson. So um, moving on to example number four, this is a shared ancestor hint for my daughter. Um, she has a shared ancestor hint for this colorful fellow, Smith Coffee. He has an interesting history. Um, we have a very good uh, paper trail. The paper trail is essentially impeccable. Uh, so we have no doubts about uh, the paper trail on either side of this equation. Um, uh, so uh, J.S. is my daughter's third cousin, two times removed. Third cousin, two times removed. And we have a shared ancestor hint. So that means not only do we share this ancestor, but we also share some DNA, or my daughter does. And um, we should take a closer look at this before we jump to any conclusions. 
In this case, uh, the shared amount of shared DNA is 6.5 centimorgans. That's, that's a very weak connection. So uh, we should be aware of that before we start to um, say that um, we have a DNA connection to bolster the paper trail. Um, if you click on this link that says, what does this mean? You get a description of what, it, what does it mean to share uh, 6.5 centimorgans. And uh, the key wor words here, uh, the key phrase in this case is, you may not be related. Well, the, the paper trail um, is good, uh, but um, I would agree that in this case, uh, the 6.5 centimorgans of DNA doesn't do much to uh, bolster what we know about our family history. And so we should uh, be careful. And in fact, uh, if we compare match lists, we find that JS is not on mom's match list. Um, as we would expect if this was DNA uh, passed from Smith Coffee uh, to the uh, two cousins in this scenario. Uh, in fact, um, JS doesn't show up on the match lists for either parent. So uh, a lesson in this case, uh, be very careful with those Cinnamorgan matches. Uh, you can see this quite frequently, even uh, with shared ancestor hints. So uh, just pay close attention to what's going on with the shared Cinnamorgans. Um, people have said that uh, when you're down near the bottom of the uh, range, uh, the bottom of the range for matches at Ancestry DNA is six centimorgans. We're down close to the bottom of the range. When you're down at the bottom of the range, you're really in a danger zone, and I would I would agree with that. So uh, just pay close attention. So example number five is a shared ancestor hint for my daughter Valentine Montgomery Eulis. Uh, he was born on 14 February 1849, so apparently his his mom was proud and uh, she gave him that name. And um, now we have a shared ancestor hint for Valentine Montgomery Eulis. Uh, this is another third cousin twice removed relationship. Um, let's look at the DNA and see what that tells us about this relationship. In this case, we have a 12 centimorgan relationship. So um, we would appear to be out of the danger zone. It's still a fairly uh, distant match. Um, we should remember uh, from the table that I put up earlier, um, as, as many as 30% of third cousins twice removed would be predicted to share no DNA. So here, uh, we're, maybe we're in uh, the luckier 70%, uh, 12 centimorgans of shared DNA. But again, if we scrutinize this match, um, even though we're uh, out of what would generally consider to be uh, be considered to be the danger zone, uh, this is a, a match who um, doesn't match uh, mom or dad. Uh, we would need we would want to see this be a match to mom. This is the this is a match uh, through the maternal line in this case with this uh, nameless cousin. Uh, but um, there, there, there's no match to either parent. So apparently we're not quite out of the danger zone. And, and so we should be careful, even when we have a shared ancestor hint, uh, to scrutinize the connections as closely as possible. You don't always have parents tested to uh, do this kind of uh, analysis, uh, but uh, you, you can uh, check shared uh, match lists and uh, look at it uh, in uh, several different ways and uh, get a sense for whether it's a, really a, a, a good uh, uh, piece of DNA evidence or not. Um, and we could have made this point with the previous example, but I'll say it here. Um, unfortunately, the lack of um, maternal DNA does not prevent a maternal hint from showing. Um, so uh, we just have to keep in mind that um, ancestry DNA uh, doesn't check these connections as rigorously as some people might assume. We have to check these connections ourselves. So to summarize, I'd say that we have three important questions to ask about our small segment matches, and uh, we've alluded to these issues already, but I, I want to state these formally here. First of all, we have to ask whether the match is false. Uh, we have to ask whether the match is usable, and we have to ask whether the uh, matching DNA is relevant to the, any shared, D, uh, shared ancestry that we've identified. Uh, we should be asking these three important questions with all of our matches, particularly the small segment matches. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. So this is a table derived from information on one of the ISOG wiki pages. Um, this is information that came um, from a process called phasing. 
And uh, I'd say the take home point here is that we see fewer problems with larger segments and we see more problems with smaller segments. And that's, that's the point here. Um, IBS means identical by state, um, basically means a bad match. IBD means uh, identical by descent, that basically means a good match. So we see with 15 centimorgans, um, more, greater than 99% of our, our matches are good matches. Uh, fewer than 1% uh, of our matches are bad matches at that level. But as we go down, um, the uh, percent of, percentage of good matches goes down and the percentage of bad matches goes up. And it goes up pretty uh, uh, relentlessly. Uh, so with 10 centimorgans, um, you, you might say that about 86% are good and about 14% are bad. If you go all the way down to 7 centimorgans, you'll see that um, most of the matches um, are not so good. So um, I certainly don't expect anybody to remember all of these numbers, but the general trend is very important. Um, small center organ matches are very problematic and you get a lot of bad matches as you go down to the bottom of the, the pile. So um, one of the popular ways of uh, exploring the issue of false matches um, we've seen this in several blog posts over the past year or so. Uh, people have looked at matches not matched to either parent. So they'll look at a child, uh, look at uh, both of the parents, and look at the match lists for the child and both of the parents and see how many discrepancies there are. Um, and with uh, most of the blog posts that I've seen recently, um, regarding match lists at Ancestry DNA, we're seeing that about 30% of a child's matches will not be matched to either parent. So that's a pretty significant percentage. Uh, but um, we can see that as we go to the lower Centimorgan matches, uh, the, the numbers are quite high. So with um, matches in the six to seven Centimorgan range, um, we'll find that about 65% of the matches for the child are not matched to either parent. So that's a pretty big warning sign that um, we are in trouble when we're in this category. Um, and things are better in the 7 to 10 centimorgan range, but still a fairly significant uh, rate of matches who are not matched to either parent. Um, at uh, the level greater than 10 centimorgans um, is looking significantly better, but still 5% at that range will be uh, matches that don't match either parent. Um, and we can debate what this means. Um, th there's some subtleties here that we should take into consideration, but I think the basic lesson here is that we have to be careful with the small centimorgan matches. I've looked at this with my own family, specifically I've looked at this with my daughter, and I found numbers comparable to what others have found. With Ancestry DNA, I found that 29% of my daughter's matches are not matched to either parent. Um, and at my Heritage DNA, the number is a little better. 22% uh, of, the, of the matches are not matched to either parent. And again, we can debate this a little bit. But uh, fortunately, um, my Heritage provides some good details that allow, allow us to dig a little deeper. Uh, I won't discuss this in detail right now because um, we probably don't really have time. Um, you can uh, follow the link to get into the details. But the take home point from this fairly busy slide is that if we focus on matches who share at least one segment that is at least 10 centimorgans in length, uh, we can probably do a pretty good job of avoiding false matches. Um, so this summarizes that point. Uh, sorting matches at MyHeritage DNA by largest segment to avoid matches who don't share at least one segment that is at least 10 centimorgans in size appears to be a pretty good strategy from what I've seen. Um, and um, this just shows you how you can do that at MyHeritage. Um, you can click on this option and it will sort your matches by largest shared segment. And if you avoid the matches that don't share at least one segment that's at least 10 centimorgans in size, um, you're, you're, um, you're, you're doing something that's, that's helpful. Um, and this is another slide that I won't go into in a lot of detail, uh, but this is just to um, emphasize the fact that um, some of these apparent false matches may not actually be false matches. We need to think about this carefully. So if you have a, a, a match that appears to be 
a very good match and you have every reason to believe it's a legitimate match, uh, keep in mind that some of these apparent false matches aren't really false positives. Uh, they could be false negatives in the other family members. And again, you can follow the link to um, look at my discussion about that issue. So earlier, um, the, we, we talked about those three questions that I mentioned. Uh, question one, is this, this, is this a false match? Uh, question two, is this a usable match? Question three, is this a relevant match? Um, this gets to question number two, usable. Is it a usable match? Um, and this is a table uh, from uh, data that Tim Jansen uh, uh, analyzed, and um, this is from the ISOG wiki page entitled Identical by Descent. And uh, the take home point from this table is that um, even if we have gotten around the issue of, of a false, a potential false positive, we still have to contend with the issue of whether the match is usable. So uh, we may have uh, analyzed a small segment match and we may have determined that we're very confident that uh, despite the fact that only a small amount of DNA is shared, uh, we're, we're still confident that it's a good match. We still have to, continue, uh, have to contend with the issue of whether it's a match that's going to be useful for us in our family history research uh, because some of these uh, small or many of these uh, small centimorgan matches or, uh, are going to be from uh, shared ancestors who are well beyond uh, the scope of our research and too many generations back uh, to be of any use in our research. So uh, with the six uh, centimorgan segments, um, we may have a shared ancestor within the past uh, six generations less than 1% of the time. Uh, with uh, six to 12 centimorgan segments, we may find a shared ancestor within the past six generations about 5% of the time, uh, and so on. 12 to 20 centimorgans, maybe we'll find a shared ancestor uh, within this, the past six generations 20% of the time. Uh, so this is yet another reason to be very cautious with uh, these low centimorgan matches. Um, we've got the false positive rate to continue to contend with, and we have the issue of uh, very distant ancestry to contend with. To contend with. So um, this is a similar uh, point uh, from a, a study by Speed and Balding uh, where they looked at um, simulated data and they determined that segments between 20 and 30 megabase pairs have approximately 40% chance of uh, coming from an ancestor greater than 10 generations back. Um, again, this is based on simulated data, so um, it's not exactly clear how well this applies to um, actual empirical um, information, um, but um, it does highlight a problem that we have. Um, and, and just to let you know, a uh, 20, uh, 20 megabase pair uh, segment is approximately 20 centimorgans. So again, we've got, we have two big problems with small segments, and we probably can't emphasize this enough. We, we contend with small matches, excuse me, we contend with false matches, and we contend with remote shared ancestry. So then uh, the question would be, what, what are we supposed to do about these distant matches? Um, these distant matches often, um, often comprise a very large percentage of our match list. And uh, you might say, well, just stick with the top of the match list, but you have new matches coming in all the time. Uh, some of these uh, low centimorgan matches are going to be um, showing up on your search results. You may be searching for a particular surname, and you'll get a small centimorgan match, and uh, you'll be um, interested in, in finding out what's going on there. Um, so uh, these small segment matches are going to um, come up in your research frequently. But I would say um, you generally should avoid uh, small segment matches. And my strategy has been to focus on matches who share at least one segment that's at least in the 10 to 15 centimorgan range. Uh, you can make exceptions to this on occasion, but I've found that um, if you get down below this, uh, you may or may not be in territory where you're dealing with a lot of false positives but uh, you're going to have a lot of difficulty um, finding the shared ancestor if you don't at least have a, a one segment that is at least 
10 to 15 centimorgans in size. And I've, uh, through the years, I've gotten to the point where I almost always look for matches that share at least one s segment that's at least 15 centimorgans in length. So the um, other uh, strategy to deal with small centimorgan uh, matches and to uh, contend with this issue is to test as many family members as possible. And we've kind of alluded to that strategy with uh, some of the prior examples. Um, you might share only six centimorgans with a match and uh, you'll compare with another family member, might be a sibling, it might be a parent, and find that uh, the other family member shares 40 centimorgans and then, or 60 centimorgans, and then um, your, um, the, the question of whether it's a good match or not uh, suddenly becomes much more clear. Um, so that's another strategy. Um, yet another strategy I didn't list here, I should have listed, um, you can compare at uh, GEDmatch or MyHeritage. Uh, get a second opinion if you're, if you're, uh, if you have a small segment match and uh, you think it might actually be a good match, you might be right, and comparison at uh, another database uh, might make things more clear. So uh, that's another important strategy. But when you're at GEDmatch, whatever you do, uh, don't lower the uh, minimum uh, segment centimorgan size. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who are lowering the match thres threshold all the way down to one centimorgan. And hopefully from the information that I've presented tonight, you can see that that's a really big mistake. Uh, but a lot of people are doing that. Uh, so we have to get away from doing that, forcing a match to show up by ad adjusting the uh, centimorgan threshold uh, down to ridiculously low numbers. It's, it's really, it's gonna send you down some rabbit holes. It's not good research, it's a waste of resources. So uh, don't get uh, caught up in that mistake. A couple of other uh, strategies, you can consider triangulation. Jim Bartlett's written a lot about triangulation, and in particular, he's written about how triangulation can uh, shed light on small segments, so you might uh, consider that as well. Um, and I've written a post on um, the role of visual, phase, uh, visual phasing in illuminating small segments. I don't want to push the envelope on this issue. Uh, there are enough people already pushing the envelope way too far. Uh, but uh, if you look at triangulation and you look at visual phasing, sometimes you can get some interesting insights about small segments. So you can follow the links to those blog posts if you're interested. So again, after I've uh, said all this about avoiding small segment matches, I'm here to tell you as well that rules are meant to be broken, and here's a good example of that. Um, L. Lee is an elderly gentleman, but he's in a lot of the DNA databases. He's a very active researcher, so it's good to have him as a cousin. Um, initially, I overlooked this match. Um, and you'll see why with these uh, numbers here on this slide. Um, at my heritage, he is shown as sharing 14.6 centimorgans with me, and our largest shared segment is 8.6 centimorgans in length. So by the rules that I've uh, told you earlier, um, this is somebody you probably want to ignore. Um, at um, Ancestry DNA, he's shown as sharing 10.7 centimorgans on just one segment. And at 23andMe, he is shown as sharing a 12 centimorgan segment with me on chromosome 7 and two other segments that are much smaller. And so um, you can see why I um, overlooked this uh, match uh, for quite a while. This is a very unimpressive, weak match. And yet, um, he is a perfect white DNA match to me at Family Tree DNA. And so, because of that, um, I did eventually uh, take a look at the autosomal uh, connections and found that he is a first cousin to two of my top autosomal matches for my direct paternal line. He shares the expected amount of DNA with those first cousins of his. And both of those first cousins share quite a bit of DNA with me and my family, uh, about 100 centimorgans with various men uh, members of my family. So, um, I looked a little closer and found that uh, the uh, autosomal DNA that he shares with my family triangulates to um, our direct paternal line, and we are actually third cousins once removed. So um, you have to be flexible with the rules. Um, you know, this was not a, a very good match. I didn't have any reason to, to believe that I should be paying attention to it. Um, wasn't linked to family tree. Um, it just didn't look very good at all, and yet um, it turned out to be a good match. So keep an up, open mind, be flexible. 
any rule is going to come with trade-offs. If you say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and look at matches that go all the way down to 10 centimorgans, you're going to be wading through a lot of bad matches or matches uh, that may be good in, in, in some sense, but uh, far too distant to um, trace back to a common ancestor. If you raise that uh, threshold to 15 centimorgans, you're going to deal with fewer bad matches, but you're going to miss a few good ones. Um, so there's a trade-off. You could, you could uh, pick 12 centimorgans and still there's, there's going to be a trade-off. So uh, there's no perfect um, threshold, uh, but I would say never say never, never say always, never say impossible. You're, you're eventually you're going to run into an example that defies all of the, uh, that defies all of the rules. So with that, I'll say thank you. It's a privilege to be able to speak with you about these issues. Um, I really appreciate your time and attention, and I would ask you to like, share, um, send by email, uh, send to your friends, post on your um, Facebook page if you, if you like this uh, post. It will be available on YouTube as well, um, so please like, share, and subscribe if you like this video. Um, and at this point, we can proceed with Q&A. You can tell me uh, any mistakes that I might have made, and we can uh, talk about some things that maybe I forgot to mention. Uh, we can have a, a good discussion um, about, um, about what we've talked about tonight. So any questions about Cinemorgans, Cinemorgan values, any confusing issues? Um, we didn't uh, talk about um, distinguishing full siblings from half siblings. Um, that's kind of beyond the scope of this discussion, but um, issues like that um, could be part of this, uh, part of the Q and A. Just whatever, whatever you might be interested in. Missed the beginning. Yeah, this will be available for uh, viewing later. Appreciate uh, the compliments. So here's a question. When you say test as many family members as possible to check matches, do they have to be siblings of, uh, or, or does a nephew work? So um, I've emphasized siblings because I have a big family and I've tested many siblings and I've found a lot of value in, in uh, testing siblings. Um, but um, you can test um, any family member, just about any family member and get value from uh, testing other family members. So. Uh, testing a nephew can be helpful, testing your own uh, kids can be helpful, uh, testing aunts, uncles, first cousins, second cousins, all of those can be helpful. The closest relatives are the most helpful. Uh, certainly if you have parents or grandparents to test, those are the top priorities. If you don't have the option to test um, parents or grandparents, um, there are other good options. Siblings are very good. That, that I would say they're almost as good as, as parents. Um, in my family, having so many uh, siblings to test um, by testing all of us, we've got seven of us tested, um, but among the seven of us, uh, we almost certainly have inherited all of the DNA that my uh, parents um, had to give us. Um, so we pro probably have about 100% coverage of, the, of both of their genomes. And uh, so uh, you can be resourceful and make use of, of the relatives that um, are willing to test. And so Deborah is saying, thank you for talking about not lowering, lowering the Cinemorgans on GEDmatch. Um, yeah, I would, it, we probably can't emphasize that enough. Um, I see a lot of really uh, bad practices in terms of lowering Cinemorgans at GEDmatch. The uh, Cinemorgan threshold at GEDmatch is already generously low. 
uh, seven centimorgans, as we um, saw with um, with uh, some of the numbers that we reviewed, uh, gets you into territory where there's a pretty high probability of running into a lot of um, false positives or bad matches. Uh, so um, there's really no need to go even lower. Um, I think the, the settings at GEDmatch are great. Uh, I think they've chosen good numbers. Um, but again, they're already pretty generous, and uh, lowering those numbers are going to come at a, a great cost in terms of accuracy. So I would say absolutely avoid lowering the Cinemorgan values. Um, as I mentioned, I linked a blog post where I talked about how visual phasing can add some nuance to this discussion, but don't push the envelope on uh, low Cinemorgan uh, values. You can, you can get into problems with uh, the extremes at both ranges. Uh, one of the, you know, we, we talked about the example where uh, the, the mat shared a, a lot of DNA or a good amount of DNA and, and we had a very a distant uh, shared ancestor hint. Um, you can get, certainly get into problems with low numbers as well if you're not paying attention. So um, paying attention to the numbers is very important and um, avoiding uh, low Cinemorgan matches is important, and whatever you do, don't make the, your challenges even more challenging by um, exposing yourself to uh, a big pool of false positives. I have a DNA match I think is distantly related on my dad's side and is for sure on my mom's side. Um, that's not terribly uncommon. I think about 1% of my daughter's matches are matches to both me and her mom. So <clears throat> it's not all that unusual. And, and um, my wife and I are probably no more closely related than um, 11th cousins. Um, we haven't been in the same gene pool. So um, this this is an issue that just as a fact of life, um, we we do have deep um, colonial American ancestry, and so um, even though our uh, families have been separated for many generations, we, we come from um, the same people who've been on this continent for hundreds of years. Is there a range difference of Cinemorgans between various comp companies offering DNA matches? So that's a very important one. And that's uh, so. Is there a, a range difference of Cinemorgans between the various companies offer, offering DNA matches? I, I think the question there is, do you get different numbers at different companies? And the answer to that question is yes. Particularly, uh, I would say, and I, ha I had a slide about this issue that I took out because I didn't know if it would um, really seem directly related, but. Um, so the issue there is that um, there is a big range, um, and I would say that um, GEDmatch and MyHeritage and 23andMe have found the sweet spot. I really like the Cinemorgan values at GEDmatch, at MyHeritage, and at 23andMe. MyHeritage hasn't always been a good place to go for good Cinemorgan values, uh, but they recently made some great updates, and so I would say they're now at the top in terms of how good their Cinemorgan numbers are. So um, I would say that those three companies offer the best numbers. Um, by contrast, I would say the numbers at Family Tree DNA are, are too high. Um, they count the tiny uh, Cinemorgan segments. They, they go down too low. And so that brings in a lot of uh, tiny segments, and that's added to the total. And so the numbers at Family Tree DNA, I think, are inflated. And um, but uh, but fortunately, at Family Tree DNA, you can sort your uh, matches by um, largest shared segment, and and by doing that, um, you can cut through a lot of the the garbage. Um, and and some of these matches just aren't any good. They're they're, they're not good matches. Um, <clears throat> So I would say the numbers um, at GEDmatch, 23andMe, and MyHeritage are good. Uh, the Cinemorgan values at um, Family Tree DNA are too high. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, 
I'm not saying that um, ancestry numbers are, are terrible, but uh, they do tend to run low. And I think um, there's, a, there's a specific reason for that. Um, ancestry DNA uh, uses a specific computer algorithm called, um, oh, why am I drawing a blank timber? <laughs> It's, a, it's almost a dirty word in this in my household. So uh, they, they use a uh, computer algorithm called Timber uh, to try to um, to call out um, DNA that um, isn't of much value. And um, I think that uh, computer algorithm is a little overzealous. And so uh, particularly for matches that are above about 90 centimorgans or below about 90 centimorgans, um, you're going to see numbers that are a little are, are a little lower or a good bit lower than what you would see at GEDmatch or MyHeritage. Um, the good news is you can go to GEDmatch and MyHeritage for free and make the comparison there and get a second opinion. And I certainly recommend doing that um, because I think those numbers are good. Are you going to post this presentation? So this presentation will be available uh, later. Um, it will be saved for viewing later, and it will be available on Facebook, and it will be available on YouTube. I'll provide links. Um, and again, please, if you if you like this presentation and you view it on Facebook or YouTube, please hit the like button and share it if you, if you want to share it with someone who um, would be interested. Uh, Henry says, "Timber is a curse word for me." Yeah, I would. Uh, that's I, I I feel the same way. Will there be a copy I can watch later? Yes. Thank you for explaining. Lots of uh, nice compliments. I appreciate that. Testing more family members and comparing the Cinemorgans really helped me to understand relationships. Uh, your chart with the general range is very helpful. Uh, the ranges are so uh, broad uh, sometimes I, I think it's important just to um, have some easy to remember numbers in mind <clears throat> and um, not get too caught up in the ranges or the uh, percentages or pro probabilities. Um, those numbers are helpful and they put things in per perspective. Um, and, and most of your uh, legitimate matches are, are going to um, fall into the categories that they're supposed to fall into. But you shouldn't panic if uh, the numbers end up being far from the average or far from the midpoint of the range. Um, because if you um, look at enough matches, you're inevitably going to find matches that uh, fall outside of the expected range. Um, these ranges are um, typically um, trying to stay within the 99th percentile, um, but um, if you um, over time look at 500 matches, um, you're going to expect some of those matches to fall outside of the expected range. So um, you, you should be willing to uh, re-examine your assumptions if you get a crazy number, <clears throat> but um, you should also keep in mind that um, just because the numbers don't uh, look the way you would expect them to look, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that there's a problem. Uh, video to understand chromosome browsers. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, maybe we need to do a chromosome browser presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going out. You have a video on SNPs, SNPs. Okay, I would say uh, you really don't have to pay much attention to SNPs. Um, and the reason you don't pay attention to SNPs, SNPs, usually um, is because um, the SNP dis density varies considerably across the genome. And so um, it's really hard to interpret SNPs. SNPs are not a good um, way of determining the distance of a relationship or the, um, the um, certainty of whether a 
segment is a good segment or not. Um, so I occasionally take a look at SNPs and, and think about that or um, make a small adjustment in a JED match uh, to the SNPs, uh, the SNPs. SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphisms. <laughs> the SNPs are what um, the uh, DNA chips are uh, detecting when they uh, test our DNA. Close family members will share a lot of SNPs and uh, distant uh, uh, people, distant relatives or uh, people who aren't related at all <clears throat> won't share as many SNPs. So SNPs are important, but uh, looking at the number of SNPs uh, on a segment or the number of SNPs total that you share with a match isn't as helpful as you might think. Um, so <clears throat> in general, you're going to, um, it's, it's not going to be as helpful as you might think. So GEDmatch reports SNPs, uh, 23andMe reports uh, SNPs, at least the SNP count. Um, but I think the vast majority of the time, you can safely ignore the number of SNPs um, and not get into any trouble. So there's an, a question here. You said it's common to have matches on both parents' side. How does that change the dynamics of the cinema organs <clears throat> and how they come up on ancestry as a match? Um, <clears throat> when I say that it's not uncommon or that it's common, um, in most of the cases, uh, for example, with my daughter where um, the mat, uh, there's, there's DNA, um, shared on both sides, um, or the match matches both parents. Um, in most cases, it's a very small amount of DNA, <clears throat> so it may not be all that meaningful. Um, and uh, because uh, my wife and I aren't from the same area of the country, um, we're not seeing a lot of um, matches that are a problem in that regard in terms of interpreting the number of Cinemorgans shared. <clears throat> but both of my parents were from the same area, and so I do get some uh, matches that are related to me on both sides, and they might be a third cousin on one side and a fifth cousin on the other side, and that can affect the Cinemorgan values. And uh, you have to keep that in mind, that uh, some of your matches will um, share a little bit more DNA than you might expect um, if you just look at one of the two connections. Uh, so you do need to take both connections into account um, and, and um, remember that you uh, could have a higher number. Um, <clears throat> but um, unless you're from a, a really highly endogamous area, <clears throat> that, may, that might not, um, um, that might not have as much impact as you would imagine. <clears throat> so I mentioned the, the um, example of a, a person who might be a third cousin on my uh, mom's side and uh, a fifth cousin on my dad's side. Well, <clears throat> that might make the numbers go up a little bit, but it might not uh, because um, the fifth cousin relationship really isn't expected to contribute a lot of DNA anyway. Uh, a fifth cousin is much more distant than a third cousin in terms of DNA. Uh, so you get far, far less DNA uh, from a fifth cousin relationship on average than you do from a, a third cousin relationship. And so <clears throat> uh, it, it doesn't always have as much of an impact as you might imagine. Um, so keep that in mind. And, and, that, and this is where you really, it really helps to get into um, matching segment details, not just to look at the total amount of DNA shared, but to look, to look at the individual segments and see if you can do some comparisons to see where each segment came from. Um, and you might find that none of the shared segments came from the more distant relationship. And, and that, that's, that's what you would expect, and I think in, generally that's, in general that's what you see. If you're related to some, someone two different ways, um, often you'll find that all of the shared DNA came from the, more, from the closer relationship, from the, from the closer shared ancestral couple. And um, none of the DNA um, will be um, attributable to the more distant ancestral couple. Uh, I, th I think more often than not, far more often than not, that's what you're going to find.
Okay, um, I guess I'm probably not going to be able to continue talking much longer. My voice is failing. Um, again, I, I very much appreciate your time and attention. Thank you for um, being a part of this presentation. Um, it's nice to give these live presentations. It, it makes it more interesting for me. So I'm glad when people are able to come to this presentation and see the see the, the live video. Uh, but it is going to be available um, later. Um, the um, Facebook um, copy of the video will be available almost immediately. And um, the YouTube video, YouTube copy of the video should be available very soon. <clears throat> so I'll go get some water as suggested. Um, we'll talk about triangulation maybe some other day. I see somebody asked a question about triangulation. Uh, I definitely um, have a keen interest in triangulation. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll find a time to talk about that. So um, thanks again, and we'll talk more later. <clears throat>